This is the temporal dead zone, which is really just, I chose that word, that term, because it's the weirdest term that comes up in the ES6 spec. Um, uh, and we will get to what it actually means and why it's important. Um, as Nick said, my name is Isaac Murchie. I work for Sauce Labs, which is a test infrastructure company. We do cross-browser, cross-platform testing. Um, and I build automation tools. So I'm not a web developer, and, and my use of ES6 or ES 2015 um, has all been server-side. I haven't tried it out other than little snippets in, in the console, but um, that's about it. And I work on Appium, which is a, a framework for mobile automation, so automating mobile devices, whether real or simulated. And that is entirely written in Node.js. So that is my, my point of departure here. Um, and with that, we recently decided to rewrite the entire thing, which is 150 to 200,000 lines of code in ES, what is now 2015, ES6. So um, we've gotten a little bit past the sorts of tutorials that you find on the web, which are all single line, maybe two lines if, if you're good, if you're lucky. Um, and we did some in ES7 just because async await is too nice to skip. So, um, and along the way, we got really excited about syntax. And as Nick said, I work on grammar, on Sanskrit. Um, and so by we, I mean I got excited <laughs> by this. Um, so what's new? And the first thing I want to talk about is block scoping. Um, and this is the first thing and the most important thing because it's the thing which changes the language itself rather than kind of making it so that you um, can more easily do things. You don't have to kind of work around the, the foibles of the language, um, which is a lot of the things that have come up in the new spec. Block scoping actually changes what the language does at a, at a basic level in many cases. And the temporal dead zone, which will come up in block scoping. So first, what happens when you run this little bit of code? So you console log a variable which is not yet declared using var. What you get is undefined. So it hasn't yet been defined. That makes some sort of sense, perhaps. Um, and why is this? Because of hoisting. Because the spec says that this is functionally equivalent to this. You take all the variables and you move them up to the top of the function and pretend that they were declared there. And then they're initialized whenever you actually declared them for the first time. Um, so in this case, everything is function scope. If it's not in a function, then, well, it's got to be in a function. But if it's in something that is below the level of a function, then it doesn't have its own scope. So if blocks, for loops, these sorts of things, they're all in the, the containing function scope. Or if it doesn't, isn't declared there, then up and up and up until you reach the global scope. So if you need something that's locally scoped for one reason or another, you need some sort of um, immediately invoked function expression. You need to make this weird thing which you immediately invoke. And then you have a new function and a new level of scope. And outside of that, if you do a console log of something which was declared inside that function, you get a reference error. And if you have come from other languages like C or other C-like languages, and JavaScript is a C-like language, and you might expect it to function the same way, you would expect this sort of error if you were to declare it in an if block rather than in a function. But you don't, as we saw. So enter block scoping with this new keywords let and const. And we won't cover const because it's basically the same as let, only you can't change the thing it points to. You can change the thing that it points to means, but what can you do about that? Um, so in block scoping, what is a block? Basically, a block is anything between curly braces that's not actually a, a literal <coughs> object expression. Um, so if we return to the same code, doing a console log of a variable which will later be declared using let, what we get is a reference error. What we would expect to have gotten 
in the other case, if we were going orthogonally with C or with one of those other sorts of languages. And the specifics is that you can't access lexical declaration Y before initialization. So what this actually should um, kind of spark in your mind is that we still have this distinction between lexical declaration and initialization, which is what hoisting does. It creates a, a case where you declare it lexically in a different place than you've initialized it. Um, and that reference error is technically the temporal dead zone. So um, fun with weird terms that they've come up with. Basically, it means that there is a time at which this variable is dead in between where it's been hoisted to and where it is actually initialized. It is useless. It will throw an error. So if you go back to var and you try to have a, an if block, this is, as I was saying, you would expect um, in, if this were C, you would expect um, certain behavior. And if it's in JavaScript and you don't have strict on, then what you'll get from this is the original 99 printed by the first console log. Then it'll be changed to 42, and it will remain 42 until you change it again. So you'll end up with a modified variable, no shadowing of that variable. But with let, all you do is change the let. And in this case, strict or not, it won't cause an error because, as you'll see, that second let is in a different scope altogether. So you get the original 99, you get a new variable y, which shadows the original variable y. That has a value of 42, and then when you break out of that scope, you're back to the original <coughs> variable y, which retains its initial um, initialization, its initial value, or whatever value it had if it was changed um, within that same scope. So if blocks, any block now will have its own scope, and any variables can be re-declared there, and they will be different than the same named variables at an enclosing scope, which <laughs> is exciting. This makes it so that what is going on makes some sort of sense. So if you think of four blocks, four blocks have those curly braces. They're creating a new scope. If you use var and just go through a normal old for loop and um, enclose that variable um, within a closure, what would you expect to be printed out by these? So you're going to create three functions, which will be called later on in the next tick. And you end up with two for every single value of i, because that value changes and it's all in one scope. And you end up at the end, however long it is, because you're going to create them all at the same time, and then they're going to be run. So you're going to end up with whatever your i is less than number um, is at the end of that for loop. And with let, instead, you actually get a new variable with each run of the for loop. So rather than getting 2, 2, 2, you get the more sensical 0, 1, 2, as you would want. So you get away from having to do, make some sort of temporary variable or you know, do something strange to save the original value and have it there inside the function and then go on and, and do what you would expect to be able to do. So again, Dwyer is surprised. So with let and const, which functions in the same way, we get real C-like scoping. We get scoping that makes it follow the sort of rules that happen in, in um, kind of at least nominally parental languages. Um, and this is exciting. This makes it, your code more terse, but more descriptive at the same time. It follows kind of how you read it rather than having to write stuff that is just solely there in order to make do with what JavaScript gave you, which was broken. Um, I guess you can't see the very bottom of this, but this is from the spec, and um, I've gone through a lot of descriptions of let and const on the web, and almost all of them um, 
kind of do away with hoisting, but hoisting is still there, and it's, it's important that it's still there. Um, so the spec says that the variables are created when their containing lexical environment is instantiated. So when that code block is instantiated, that variable is created. It's hoisted to the top of the block. Um, but then it says that it may not be accessed in any way until the variable's lexical binding is, in, is run, basically. I can't remember, instantiated, perhaps, again. Basically, this is spec speak for until it is initialized, you can't do anything with it. And that gap is the temporal dead zone um, and will cause errors and basically mean that you've got to um, declare them at the top of a block like you would in other languages. Some languages enforce that. Um, JavaScript enforces it by giving you a runtime error if you don't do it. Um, and if you just declare it as let x semicolon, it'll be um, undefined but still alive if you're taking the temporal dead zone literally. Um, so that is block scoping. This is a major change in how the language works. Um, and it makes code quite a bit cleaner. It's, it's surprising how much um, of our code kind of plays around with scoping in weird ways just to get around it. And many of the other things that come up in ES 2015 are um, of the same sort, although less structural to the language. So they are there to um, kind of clean up oddities, to stop you from having to contort yourself into how the language wants you to do something in order to do it, um, which is a good thing. So arrow functions. Uh, if you have a callback function that you just declare as a normal function, um, it becomes or can become a more simplified thing that's not called a function, doesn't have the function keyword anymore, but has this arrow um, pointing to it. So it's, it's slightly shorter, yay. Um, but as the Sanskritists say, um, <laughs> which basically means that grammarians delight in the shortening of something by a half syllable as they do when a son is born. So <laughs> this, is, um, this is what's happening if you love the fact that function becomes a two characters instead of however many characters are in function. Um, what's more important is that um, the function used with the arrow lexically inherits the scope of its parent, of the, the surrounding scope. So you don't need to do var that equals this, or self equals this, or however you like to go about doing that. Or you don't have to do the ubiquitous bind this, um, because this inher is inherited by the surrounding scope when it's declared. So that's a major win. Um, I don't, in Appium, we probably wrote that 1,500 times, bind this. And you'd forget it, and halfway through your 10-minute run of tests, it would crash because some function's undeclared on this because you have global scope. So that's no longer a problem with the arrow functions. The second thing that, in my <coughs> use of ES6 or ES2015, um, made life easier, made life better, was spread or rest, which is the same operator used in different contexts. Um, so have you ever needed to use function.apply to spread out an array into named parameters? So you have a function that takes three parameters and you have an array that has three elements and you want those elements to be the three. Um, so something like this, which does what you want it to do but is silly and if you're new to it, doesn't make any sense that you're doing this. You now have three little dots, which will do the same thing. Um, spreads out an array into named parameters. So both of those function calls will console log one, two, three, because x, y, and z will become one, two, and three. Um, so as the spread operator in the, the two operators with the same 
uh, look, I guess. It takes an array and produces a series of individual values. Um, it can be in a function call, as we just saw, where um, the dot, dot, dot array is functionally equivalent to the direct um, call to the function. But it also can be used in assignment and any expression, basically. So um, you can make a, an array from other arrays and not have to flatten it in any way or anything like that. Um, it just becomes much shorter and um, it, your code makes sense. This step of having to call a, a static apply method is uh, circumvented, I guess. Both um, produce that. Um, and then, have you ever used the arguments array-ish thing um, to get a variable number of arguments in a function um, or you know, imported vargs or some other library to do it for you? Um, so you end up, again, with something which would confuse a beginner, confuse everybody, pretty much, um, having to go into the prototype call slice on your arguments um, just to get an array of, of what was passed in. Now, with the dot, dot, dot argu or, uh, operator, this time inside the, the formal parameters of your function, what you get as args is everything that was passed in. So what you would have gotten by saying array.prototype.slice.call arguments. Um, so you end up with the same outcome. Um, and it can be, it is the rest operator, it's called. And that belies the fact that you can also just have it as the last, um, the last parameter in a, in a parameter list, much like Python with the um, keyword arguments and things like that. Um, so you don't need to do the arguments slice with, you know, three instead of zero and change it every time you decide to add a new name parameter or some silly stuff like that. So you end up printing out, in this case, one, two, and then an array of three, four, five, or however many more parameter or arguments you sent to your function. Um, so those are not uh, structural to the language, but I mean, they're structural to the language, but they don't change the fundamental operation of the language. They are pretty exciting in terms of writing code, um, taking an old function and writing it in this new way, um, and then comparing the two it's, it's oftentimes night and day, the, the things that you had to do and you just kind of memorized them and did them and didn't think about them, but now that you don't have to do them, you begin to think about them again. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so, sorry, default parameter values. Um, you no longer have to do weird expression stuff to configure default values. You don't have to do this nonsense where it is the first, or if the first isn't there, then it's 42, uh, that sort of thing. With all of the foibles of passing in null, and if you want null in there, then see, are you going to have to say is default, or um, compare the type of default, type of equals default, or some stuff like that in order to, or not default, uh, undeclared, undefined. Um, you end up having to do a lot of massaging in order to allow yourself to have things like null, like zero, which will come out as false, any kind of falsy value um, you have to deal with in strange ways. Whereas now, you're going to say that first is equal to 42, and second is equal to 99, and go on your way. And what this will do is if it's undefined, if you pass in undefined or you don't pass in anything, then you'll get whatever it's equal to. And if it's null, it'll be, or any kind of um, thing which can be coerced into a primitive, it will be coerced into that primitive and um, used rather than a default value. So you, you can send in null, and first will be null, it, as it really should be. Um, 
another topic which I've spent a lot of time in my programming life kind of uh, making temporary variables in order to get around is the idea of destructuring. So handling of particularly return values. If you have a function that returns um, a complex value and you want parts of it. So if you imagine you have a function that returns an array, um, say an array of two values. It's a you know, get position or something that returns x, y as an array. Um, and you want to use it as x and y. Currently, or in ES5, you would need to have a temporary variable and then take the individual parts of that temporary variable and assign them to new variables x and y. You have this extra step, and the extra step is not obvious what is happening, why you do this if you're just casually reading through code, particularly if you're new to the style of JavaScript, um, why you need this temporary or return value is not entirely clear, and your scope becomes kind of messed up, becomes dirtier and dirtier, um, particularly if you have lots of nested blocks where things have to happen, you have a lot of this going on, um, it becomes very difficult to, to reason about. With the new style, you can just say let, and then this thing that looks like an array of x and y is equal to your function call. And lo and behold, after that, x is equal to the first element of the array you passed back, and y is equal to the second one. If there's a third one, it's ignored, on and on. So now you only need one line. Not only do you only need one line, you don't need an extra variable which was in there, which um, who knows what is happening with it at runtime actually. Is it optimized away? Is this actually what's happening under the hood when, you're, when your uh, interpreter runs? Who knows? Um, but if you also imagine that you have a function that returns an object um, or an associative array and you want to have the members of it. So you don't want to be dealing with position.x and position.y all the time. You just want x and y. Um, then, again, previously, you'd get a temporary variable, and you'd pull x and you'd pull y out, and you'd had individual um, declarations of those and instantiations of those. Um, and now you can just say let, and then this object, which is assigning them, you can change the variable names if you have a function that you didn't make but you um, are using and you think that to your mind it works better with different variable names, you can change what they come out as. If it's like this where they're the same, then you can get even closer to concise by just saying x and y and it will assign um, the similarly named or same named um, properties of that hash to your new variables. And after this, you will have a fully functional x and a fully functional y variable without any um, hash qualification. So that's seemingly pretty simple change. And, and um, I realize it doesn't really, it's not that much pain to have this odd return value. But in the new style, your code is doing what it's saying it's doing rather than doing something else in order to do what it's saying to do, what it's doing. <laughs> oh, shoot. Um, so this is a step in the right direction. Code that does what it says and says what it does. Basically, you can read the source code and reason about everything in it. Um, next thing is template literals, which um, particularly in the world of JavaScript where templates are a thing. This doesn't really make any sense um, to have called them this. But um, do away with any kind of ideas of templates as like a thing in which you like parse it and add variables to it. It's sort of in that vein, but it's entirely different as well. So if you know Ruby, it's much <coughs> like string interpolation in Ruby. So you can declare well, this is what you do now, just adding two strings together, um, or adding a string and an object, which will become a string. Now you can 
have these little back tick um, operators to declare the string, and the string will be interpolated, or the variable will be interpolated into that string. And that becomes an actual string. If you were to save it in a variable, it is a string. It's not like a template in the rest of the world where you'd save it in a variable and then you'd run some sort of render or parse or something on it in order to get an actual string that had the variables into it. This is a real string that has, happens to have that value of that variable embedded into it um, as a string. So if you were to save the part of the, the thing that's inside console log in a variable and then do type of, it would be string. Um, so it's a bit confusing terminologically, but um, very useful in terms of um, actual use. It's also like here docs in, in Ruby. If anybody's used here docs, basically you um, start a string with this weird percent %q thing, and then it's multi-line. You can put whatever you want in it and close it, and it will retain that if you wanted um, something with some sort of formatting in it. So um, this sort of thing, the end of Shakespeare's 64th sonnet, would not, um, does not become a single line and get printed out if you were to console log that. It retains the new lines um, and is, ends up being easier than having a bunch of backslash ends and whatnot in the middle of your thing or plus signs to add a bunch of new line terminated strings together. So thinking them more along the lines of the Ruby equivalents, I'm not sure if Ruby had anything to do with it. I won't malign the creators of ES6. Um, but those are in Ruby are very useful and are extremely useful. This one with the here doc part, slightly less. I haven't come across too many places where I've needed to use it, except perhaps in logs to print out some sort of um, startup information or something that I want formatted in a particular way. Um, but the string interpolation happens all the time. There's so many cases where um, I've changed it to the string interpolation away from the pluses, or where you were using the string concatenation and forgot a plus or accidentally erased it, and then um, things went along and you got a runtime error from that. Um, it's a pain. And then finally is just a bunch of little things that are not so easily categorized and, and just kind of give you a cleaner path through your code. So one is computed property names and object literals. <coughs> Who's ever done something like this, where you create an object, then you have a key which you don't know what it is, it's coming in, or you had to add two strings together to become a, a key or something like that, and then you return the object. You can now just do, again, a strange square brackety kind of thing, but the key then becomes the key, the property in that object without needing to have the instantiation and the initialization of the properties be a different step. So that's a step in the right direction in making things clear. Um, the reuse of the square brackets, a little less so, but um, that's it's okay for now. Um, again, moving towards code that says what it means and means what it says. Um, as was mentioned earlier, for of loops. So um, it loops over the values in an array as opposed to for in loops that loop over the indexes in an array. So you can just straight up console log the, the variables that are created. And like the normal for loops, this letter here is a new, basically a new variable in each iteration of the for loop. So if you close over it and have a function that's called later, it will have the value of that particular iteration of the for loop rather than constantly changing. Unless, of course, okay, you use var letter, in which case you've done away with all of those benefits. Um, 
So as a person who likes languages, likes languages that don't necessarily use Latin, don't necessarily use um, the basic Unicode, you have much better Unicode support in ES6. So you can do full regular expressions using a, the U um, flag. You can don't have to use an external library to normalize Unicode. Um, the string methods know Unicode. So if you have an emoji that happens to be outside of the basic multiplane or multilingual plane, um, and you do in ES5, you do length on it, it'll be two. Um, now, if you do length on it, it'll be one, because it's only one character, really. Just ES5 didn't understand that. Um, so there's support for full Unicode standard with no need for like two slash u or backslash u um, hex values. You can actually specify the entire hex value for the entire um, Unicode letter. Um, something that was a pain in the ass in, in different environments, special uh, official specification of numbers. So no longer do will things be uh, whatever the maker of your engine wanted them to be to specify a binary number or octal number. You've got standards. Um, so my time is pretty much up, but this has just been kind of the things that have popped out to me as I've spent the past few months working on ES 2015, um, which has become an actual standard now, um, and have changed the way that I use JavaScript, have made it more in line with how I use other languages and how I've kind of been brought up to understand how languages work. Um, and there's a plethora of more things, and hopefully you'll find ones that are exciting to you if you're not so excited by let. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much, and thank you for listening.